I was telling you about the woman who had the who was a servant, and she for a very wealthy man, and he had had no heirs, and he left her his whole entire fortune, and uh, she had framed his you know will and put it up on the wall, and she didn't know how to read. So she didn't realize that she had the, uh, a mass fortune at her fingertips. And she lived in a shack and she lived in poverty um, after he died because uh, she didn't realize what she had. Um, so, so the reason I talk about that story, and I've heard that story told by many pastors, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's still a good story to think about. Because it's a crazy story and we think, oh my gosh, you know, this lady with this fortune, you know, hanging on her wall. And, and her shag, you know, who would do that? Who could be so ignorant? And yet we do it every single day. Yeah. We're that lady, yeah. okay? And we have the last will and testament, uh, many of us like laying on our nightstands, okay? And uh, we sure have it, um, this treasure map on our telephones. And we have the hope of today on our smart TV. And we have the answers to every problem life throws at us right there on our computer, and yet we continue in ignorance and suffer. Do we not? Mm -hmm. And so the treasure map that I'm speaking of, the map to this mine that we are um, mining, is the Bible. And today, you can get it anywhere, at any time, and we are literally without excuse. And so, in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. So, what his thoughts, his ways, hmm, let's think about that. His thoughts, his ways. So, I talked about Gary Cassie last, last week, and I told you uh, how he had gone through nine years of terrible financial you know, hardship, and he had four, four kids, I think, or during that nine years, and um, had just just lived hand to mouth, and um, and yet he said that the Lord told him when he finally got to the end of himself, collapsed on his bed, you know, crying out to God, Lord, you know, help us, okay, because he was facing a lawsuit and bankruptcy, the Lord spoke to him and said, you have never taken the time to learn how my kingdom operates. So I would say, I bet the majority of us know this scripture, and yet we have never pondered really what this scripture means, and we've never set out to find out what his thoughts are, and what his ways are. Just like God told Gary to see. And so we don't take the time to find out what God thinks, and, and what his ways are, and we continue on in ignorance. Uh, until we die and we don't take the word seriously and we don't meditate on it and we don't apply it to our lives so i talked this and i taught this in sunday school recently about asking and um and i and i know y'all everybody in my sunday school class has heard this but for those who haven't i'll just tell you again recently for about two years i i started suffering from debilitating uh weak spells every morning between 7 30 and 11 30 and it was terrible, and I would have to lie down and just wait till it passed, and sometimes I would actually have to sleep it off, they were so bad. And it was literally interfering with my life, and um, because, you know, I know it's coming, because it came every morning. So, you know, I was afraid to leave the house, and sometimes I'd just make myself, you know, I had to, you know, uh, working and stuff, all okay. kinds. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, um, Anyway, so finally one day, I had just had enough. Now, I've been praying for healing. I've been taking communion. I've been reading on healing, studying healing. I mean, I was doing everything I knew to do. But I, healing wasn't coming. And so finally one day, I was so tired of it. I said, I asked the Lord, and I said, what is causing these spells? I said, please, Lord, tell me, you know, what is causing this? And immediately, I got a word of knowledge. And the word of knowledge said thyroid medicine. That's all it said. Thyroid medicine. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my thyroid medicine. Really, Lord? You know? And uh, and so I, I said, okay, Lord, as of the, tomorrow morning, because I'd already taken it that day, as of tomorrow morning, I'm not taking that medicine anymore. And and I said, you, I said, I'm depending on you to heal me because if, if that's it, then I'm just stopping cold turkey and it's up to you. 
So I stopped and it took about two weeks for the medicine to completely get out of my system. But I have not had one of those spells since then. Okay. So, uh, so just like the old servant, see, we die broken and we die far less than what God desired for us to have. And, and the reason is, just like that woman in our story, we just, we, we just take it for what it says. We read that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. So we say, yeah, oh, he's so far above us. How can I think what he thinks? How can I know his ways? He's so far above us. But what we should be asking is, Lord, what are your ways? What are your thoughts? See, if I hadn't asked that day, he, he wasn't healing me. But, but when I asked, he answered me. Okay? And so we have, to, we have to ask those questions. Lord, what are your thoughts? What are your ways? And that's what we're mining for on these Wednesday nights. We're mining for his thoughts and his ways. And if anybody wants to say anything, just jump in, okay? So uh, my journey started seriously some years ago, and I want y'all to pay attention to this, when a friend of mine just mentioned casually that she started her morning every day with Joyce Meyer. What she told me, that simple statement, changed my life, okay? And I want y'all to really take that to heart. You don't know what tiny little thing that you may say that would that literally changes somebody's life. So she said she watched Joyce Meyer before she went to work every morning. So I thought to myself, well, I should do that because I had been in the habit of watching Fox News in the mornings before going to work. So the very next day, I did just that, and I started my day with Joyce Meyer, and that began a journey that I would have never believed. And now, I have read the Bible, and I've studied it for years. I've read it since a child, but this time, God led me to his diamond mine, and all because I made a conscious decision to start my day with him. So I found the diamond mine all because I made a decision to start my day with him. So guess what? And I will say that James is finding his diamond mine right now because he has finally made a decision that he's not going to do it his way anymore. Well, and I have an amen to it. 33 and a half minutes. Okay. Well, it took, me longer, than the road. It took <laughs> me longer than that. But uh, so, you know, more recently, um, when a need arose with, uh, I, I said just with one of my children, I'm sure it was James. <laughs> no, it was Robert. It was hard. And God told me to, to go home and get that book out. Remember I told y'all last week? And I said, the Lord told me to go home, get that book out that I had read a few years ago. And at that time I read it, it really didn't impact me. It didn't really change me. I didn't really get it. And this time it opened a, it opened a door to the word that has been life changing. So I read another little book a couple years ago by Dodie Osteen. And it was entitled, I Was Healed of Cancer. And that book really impacted me. Now, she was weeks away from death and from liver disease. And she came home from the hospital basically to die. Liver cancer. Yeah, liver, liver, yeah, liver cancer. And she came home to die. But um, her husband brought her home. And, and y'all know who her husband was. This, this is Joel Wolstein's mother. And this is um, John Osteen's wife. So he brought her home, and he they knew that the doctors, I mean, they couldn't do anything else for her. And they and they brought he brought her home, and they began to seek God. And she began herself every day to seek Him. And she wrote down healing scriptures, and she spoke them daily, and she meditated on them. Now I want you to get this: is she didn't read them as a formula. So we tend to do that. We make everything a formula, right? She didn't read them as a formula, but rather what she did was she renewed her mind yes. with those scriptures, and she got it in her mind what God thinks. I want to add something. Yeah. She was diagnosed. She had no idea she had cancer. She just wasn't feeling well. <laughs> and so when they found out, they gave her two to four weeks to live because it was already stage four. They said there's nothing we can do. No. So, so do you get that? She, she got in the Word and found out what he thinks about, about healing and then what he desires uh, for, for us in the area of healing. That's what we need to do. 
And so, but, but I want you to watch this, what she did. What she did was she resisted the disease. Now, she could have come, gone home and gone straight to bed and never got out of that bed and she would have died there. But that's not what she did. She went on and she resisted and she made herself, in that little book she said, she made herself literally barely able to walk. She made herself get up and actually go out and pray for other people that were sick. Now, I've never been that sick, but I tell you what, I've had the flu so bad that I thought I was dying. And I can't imagine dragging myself out of my sick bed and going and praying for anybody. Okay, so I got kudos to her. But um, I don't believe she could have done this in her own strength. Okay. And uh, she, but what she did was she set her mind to fight the disease. And I think that this is a huge diamond in the mind of God's word. So James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will what? Flee. He will flee from you. So guess what? Who, who brings disease? The devil. The devil. All right. So the d disease is from the devil. It's part of the old kingdom. So, But we're born into the new kingdom. When you're born again, you're literally born into a new kingdom. And disease has to be resisted. And so uh, what she did was, I want to go on and tell a little bit more of her story. What she did was she wrote letters of apology to everybody she thought she had hurt or that she felt odd against, okay? She wanted to rid her soul of that, like the word says. She literally saw God and did what he said to do in his word. She, what she did is she took his word seriously. And her life was quickly expiring, and this, this was literally her only hope. So if she died, she would have died in the knowledge that she did everything the Word told her to do. And she was right and she was ready, but, but guess what? Death didn't come. Healing did. And so as of 2019, she has been alive 38 years after being given a maximum of six weeks to live. And how did she do that? Well, she mined the Word. She was healed. She tapped into the kingdom. So she tapped into God's system, his government, and that's what we're going to learn on these Wednesday nights is the ways of his kingdom and his government. Now, I don't want any of us, me included, to, to wait until we're back against a wall, until our life is almost over and we're fa facing bankruptcy or calamity of some sort. What I want us to do is, before anything like that happens, is to mind the word for the diamonds, making a decision, every one of us tonight, that we're going to reach out to God and we're going to ask him to make known to us these hidden diamonds, these gems of his word, of how his kingdom operates and the laws by which he works, and to bring it alive to us so that we can live the way that he desires us to live. Because because he we, he has so much greater stuff for us than we can even imagine. <clears throat> I was going to give a personal testimony on that. Sure. Um, more than 20 years ago, Bob and I have been married forever. Um, we got to a point where I didn't want to be married to him anymore. I, you know, I, I, I'm up to here. No, this was not, this was no. So I know. I, know. I, went, I I just left. I said I'm leaving. I'm going to the beach. I'm gonna think about it. So I left. I went to the beach. I, but what I did every day, I was there by myself in my room, reading my Bible every day, walking up down the beach praying, talking to God. That's all I did every day for a whole week. And what is so weird? <laughs> Because I did not want to be married to this person. I had a long scroll. I didn't want to be married to this person. And uh, during that week, he would call me every day. The Lord showed me this. The Lord showed me that all these things that were driving me crazy. And it was like I couldn't get through to him when I talked to him about it. But all of a sudden, the Lord would get through to him. So that week, the Lord got through to him on. on not everything, but the major things. And by the end of the week, not only that, but by the time he actually decided to come down and join me. And by the time he got there, the 
glory of heaven, a feeling of love for him in my heart that I didn't have what I got down there. So in one week's time, I was spending that much time searching the Lord, searching his word, talking to him about it, saying whatever it is you want, you, you make it happen. Because he did. It. And he did. It. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And that's the whole thing. 46 years now. Yeah, it's not about what we do for him. It's about what he does, does for us. us. But you yeah. have to search out his yes. word and find what he wants for you and, and submit your will to his desire exactly. he has for you. Amen. I want to give something on yeah, that sure. about when you were saying choice and what she did. Is in that movie Fireproof, you know, the Kennedy yeah, Brothers. Just awesome, awesome movie. Just awesome movie. And I remember I was watching that, and the thing that stuck out the most to me, and I never forgot it, is when uh, Kirk Cameron is sitting there and he's fighting pornography. And he's going through that stuff, but he's half heartedly doing it. But he is going through the word and, and mm -hmm. things of, you know, spiritual things. But what hit me when he was sitting on the couch and he's got the computer there and the pornography is coming up yeah. is the Spirit of the God, God just said, he made a choice though. He chose, he got up and he chose to take that computer out and to beat it up and to let it go. And that was the first time I ever, it just struck me so clearly, you know, we want to just wave a wand or, you know, twitch your nose or something and, and it just happens. And that's not the way it happens. Just like she did. She had to make a choice though, yes. instead of going to the beach and doing whatever she wanted and maybe getting into trouble and doing stuff she shouldn't do, she went and she sought the Lord. And it just struck me with him. That's he had to make a choice, and we all come to that crossroad exactly. to make a choice. And then the, the Lord can do something with that. Yes. You know, we, we give him know. an inch, and he takes the mile. That's exactly you know? right. It, yeah. What what Carol was talking about, what you're talking about, is obedience. Yeah, right. And obedience is not a work. Some people yeah. think that obedience is a work, but obedience is just saying, Lord, mm -hmm. I'm going to follow you. Yeah. I'm your disciple. I'm going to follow you. But then you realize that in your strength, you've made it perfectly clear, you didn't want to love Bob anymore. Mm -hmm. But because you were obedient, wanting to follow Jesus, wanting to follow God, wanting to be in his perfect will, he gave you not only a supernatural love again for your husband, but he enabled you through his power and strength to overcome what the devil had set up. There's a landmine to destroy it. And so the beautiful thing about our Heavenly Father is he has... All we, he will not usurp your will. The Holy Spirit will woo you to himself and do everything he can, but you just choose to follow him and then rest in the fact that he will see you through. Yes. It will be his strength that opens doors, closes doors, carries you when you can't walk yourself. Right. And we can rely on that yes. because Christ finished it at the cross, everything we have need of. Come to Sunday school because that's what I'm talking about. Um, and Sunday school is being led by the Spirit. So how do you, how, are, how do we live this life and be led with His thoughts and His ways? But uh, so some years ago, Jeff and I went to a, a Atlanta Braves game, and that's when the stadium was in Atlanta. And um, when we were leaving, um, you know, right. we left, as I recall, a little bit, you know, how before the game ends, so he can beat all the people in the traffic and everything. And he was literally, if y'all know how he walks, he speed walks, okay? I mean, almost to a run. And so, you know, he's speed walking to the car. And, uh, you know, in his mind, he, we're in a bad, bad place. We can well, get in my mind, we're in a bad place. Okay, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, so I'm, you know, I don't know how many, you know, as my usual, 12 paces behind him. You know, I was, I was Anyway, so I twisted my ankle. Okay. So I really didn't think I could walk. I mean, it was hurting, you know. Well, he jerks me up, tells me to walk it off. We're in a bad place. And to my great surprise, as I walked, it stopped hurting. And I have never forgotten that. Okay? And the reason is it reminds me of resisting the devil. Okay, because had he not made me get up and walk, I probably would have sat there and nursed well, that. Well, you gotta understand, we also had James and Robbie were little boys, so I had both of them. I couldn't carry all three. I don't them. remember them. Yeah, they were there. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember that. <laughs> I remember anyway. going to the Braves game a couple times as a kid yeah. at the old, old County Stadium. Yeah, we were never there by ourselves. But them. it just reminded me of resisting the devil. Walk it off. Okay, get out of the bed. 
You know, get out of your sick bed, get in the work, turn the TV off, do whatever you got to do, walk it off, okay? Resist the devil. And then Romans 12, 2 says, he's embarrassed by that, but you know, if anybody knows him, you know. I was walking behind her going, move it, move it, move it. Oh, you can see it. I walk behind her. Y'all know the truth. Y'all know the truth. I see no guys are coming to my rescue. <laughs> sins, victory over bad attitudes, anything. Jesus finished it at the cross. So really, when you read the scriptures, you're not, you're more than just reading the word of God, you're learning of him. Amen. So, uh, you know that old saying, the devil's in the details? Well, that's an old idiom, an idiom, devil's in the details. Have you heard that one? Please. Oh my you bless your heart. <laughs> She's an athlete. I'm going to I bought her, when we were on vacation, I bought her a book of How to Talk Southern. <laughs> I'm going to buy her a book of idioms for Christmas. So, uh, anyway, so I looked at that saying, and this is what Wikipedia says. It says it refers to a catch or mysterious element hidden in the details. A catch or mysterious element. 
mysterious element hidden in the details, meaning that something might seem simple at a first look, but will take more time and effort to complete than expected and derives from the earlier phrase, God is in the details. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting. It started out, God was in the details, and Satan stole it, and now it's the devil's in the details. So um, so that's just a great example of how Satan twists everything, does he not? So, so what we've done here in the last week and uh, half of tonight, what we've done is we've laid a foundation of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And we're setting out to search the scriptures for the diamonds in the mine or the laws of the kingdom that tell us how to live in the peace and joy that Christ came to bring in this new government or this new kingdom. So are you ready to mine the word? Yes. Are you excited to mine? Yes. Yes. All right. So when we go into the mine, it's hard work, is it not? It's hard work, but the rewards are huge. And so I hope that you're going to reap huge rewards as I am from studying this out. So the first diamond that we're going to find in our mind of God's word is diamond number one. And the, and the diamond is you are what you eat. <laughs> you are what you eat. That is the diamond number one. So Mark 4.22 <laughs> lays out this first mystery, this first diamond, which follows the parable of the sower, okay? And Jesus is telling the disciples the reason that he spoke in parables. And then he goes on to say, and if anybody doesn't know what a parable is, Jesus spoke in the New Testament in parables, he told stories. And, and, and all through the New Testament, he tells, he tells stories. And so the, the disciples don't understand why he's telling all these stories. And so they ask him. So in Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 22, it says, For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. If any man had ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath to him shall be given, and he that hath not from him shall, even, shall be taken even that which he hath. Now I want to read it again, because that's a little hard in the King James. So now we're going to read it again. In, in the next uh, slide, and, and it's the uh, Berean Study Bible. And it says, For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. He went on to say, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more will be added to you. For whoever has will be given more, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So the first mystery of the kingdom is, again, you are what you eat. So if you eat the word, meaning you put the time into it, you read it, you meditate on it, you spend time in prayer, then just as we read in those scriptures, the amount of time you spend will be added to you. It will prosper you. It will bring you supernatural results. And, it, and you'll begin to where you'll uh, begin not reaping the things of the world, but you'll be start reaping the things in the spirit. And, and those are, let's, they are prosperity. They are good health. They are all the good things that Jesus died to give us. So now I want to read it one more time, and we're going to read it out of the Amplified Bible. It says, For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it would come to light. That is, things are hidden only temporarily until the appropriate time comes for them to be known. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear and heed my words. Then he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. By your own standard of measurement, 
That is, to the extent that you study spiritual truth and apply godly wisdom, it will be measured to you, and you will be given either, even greater ability to respond, and more will be given to you besides. For whoever has a teachable heart to him, more understanding will be given, and whoever does not have a yearning for truth, even what he has will be taken away from him. So you see, by your own standard of measurement, that is to the extent that you study spiritual truth and apply godly wisdom, it will be measured to you. And you will be given greater ability to respond, is what the Amplified states in the commentary. Now, uh, I was talking to um, a couple the other day and uh, and they got a scathing email from a friend. It was actually a very frightening email. And this man evidently is into some really horrific, um, demonic, murderous stuff. And uh, in his email to uh, this person, he, he quoted scripture. But one thing that stuck out to me was he said, I can't believe you are one of those, meaning a Christian. And he said... Um, he said, um, and he kind of threatened, threatened him, but, but he said, I can't believe that you would um, be one of those, um, how, how do you put it? Um, I know what I'm trying to say, but I can't get it out. Um, he said that you, that you would, yeah, foolish person that would follow a God that um, created you with a free will, but judges you for. But see, according to this scripture, Jesus says that, that, that you're going to reap what you sow. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, God gave each one of us a free will. But, but that's what a free will does. You decide. And so this man, you know, was quoting scriptures throughout this scandal and threatening email. Okay, so, so he's hanging his own self. He knows what the word says, but he's made a decision not to follow it. In fact, I think he's in the Satanism. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. And, uh, but, but see, I want y'all, that's why I read that three times. You know what? When you stand before God, it, 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 he, he, he's inside. I gave you the choice. I gave you a free will. I, I did everything I could for you. So if you reject it, it's on you. Okay? So he doesn't, he doesn't you know, he's not going to, um, he's not going to force you in any way, shape, or form. It, it's totally up to us. So by, by your own standard of measurement, that is, to the extent that you study spiritual truth and you apply godly wisdom, it will be measured to you, and you will be given even greater ability to respond. And that's what the Amplified Bible says in the commentary. But let's reverse that. If you just say, absolutely, no way, don't want it, not going to have anything to do with it, fine, that's your choice. But you will read that that you have sown and chosen. So the note in my Joyce Meyer study Bible says this about Mark 24. It says this Mark 24 is a great scripture. It tells us that the more time we spend thinking about the word we read and hear, the more power and ability we will have to obey it. The more revelation knowledge we will have about what we have read or heard. Basically, this tells us that we will get out of God's word what we put in it. I want you to receive maximum benefit from God's awesome word. So be diligent to read it, study it, and apply it to your life. Now, I just want to throw this in there. If, if any of you don't know who Joyce Meyer is, uh, she has an unbelievable testimony. I've got it on DVD of her testimony. And uh, she was... Uh, uh, sexually molested by her own father, by her birth father, for years until she was like 18 years old. Okay, she had a horrible life, and uh, her testimony is is worth uh, find. It's probably on YouTube or something. But if, if you haven't listened to her testimony, I would listen to it. And uh, she was a very hard, uh, callous, hurt person. But she found her way to the throne. And he has literally done unbelievable things in her life. So to me, she's an absolute uh, awesome inspiration. So um, 
So let's look at, we're going to look at the parable of the ten virgins, and that's in Matthew 25, 1, 3, and 13. <clears throat> and this is a parable, a story that Jesus told. So we're going to look at the story, and we're going to see why did he tell this story, and what is he telling us through this story. So the, the parable of the ten virgins. So it says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them and sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So we see from that scripture that everyone is called. Everyone has the same opportunity. Everyone um, has, and I love all the stories about the Muslims that, that, that are coming out, about uh, people in the Arab world, Muslims, you know, uh, because they don't have an opportunity to hear. The, literally, so many of them are having visions and dreams, and the Lord, literally, Jesus is appearing to them in their dreams and, and actual visions. Okay, well, why? Because they don't have any other opportunity. I read an article the other day that said the fastest growing church was in Iran. Yeah, it's in Iran. It's an That's awesome. church. Yeah. That's awesome. So, you know what? God, you know, you may think you're out in the middle of the jungle somewhere, but God is there. Yeah. And I read a cool book, I can't remember the name of it, a couple years ago. But it was about uh, about the Amazon jungle and the natives that lived in the Amazon and how they were possessed with all these demons and how they smoked dope and you know contacted all these demonic spirits and stuff. But but then and they they didn't know. But uh, Jesus, <coughs> the spirit was coming to them. You, you know, and it was about how they you know a bunch of them got saved and stuff. It was so awesome. So what I'm saying was he'll he'll get to you one way or the other. He'll knock on your door one way or the other, you know, and when he does, don't turn him away. That, that, that's what we want to get from that. And so, um, so, um, all right, so now I want to read the parable, another story that Jesus told, and this one's the parable of the servant, and it's in Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, and it's pretty long, but I don't think it's important to read, and, um, and we want to read it and get the entire meaning. Okay, and, and I'm going to read it from the Brian Study Bible just to make it a little bit easier. All right, and it says, For it is just like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his possessions. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his own ability. And he promptly went on his journey. The servant who had received the five talents went and put them to work, and he gained five more. Likewise, the one with the two talents gained two more. But the servant who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. So after a long time, the master of those servants returned to settle accounts with them. The servant who had received the five talents came and presented five more. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, so I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the servant who had received the two talents also came and said, Master, you have entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. 
And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. <clears throat> and finally, the servant who had received the one talent came and said, Master, I knew that you're a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So in my fear, I went and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what belongs to you. You wicked, lazy servant, replied his master. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Then you should have deposited my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received it back with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw that worthless servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I've always read that and felt sorry for that man that didn't grow the one talent. How about you? Does anybody else felt sorry for him? <laughs> okay, Carol's saying no, she didn't. I always did. And uh, so I thought, well, he did the best he could. He did the best that he knew how. That's what I would always think. But therein lies the problem. See, I had faulty thinking. Because really, what this is telling us was that he did not prepare. And he had the same call, he had the same opportunity for success and salvation, but he did what he thought was best. And that's what we've been talking about, James. It, he's just now gotten to the point where he realizes what he thinks is not best. Okay? And I'm telling you, I'm learning, and I'm learning through Sunday school. Because we're talking about being filled with the Spirit. We're talking about being led by the Spirit. That, that literally, you can so be led by the Spirit, by the Spirit, that you don't do anything. And uh, and I want to tell you uh, something about Pete. Y'all know Pete Smith, Pastor Pete. He pastors in Jasper. Uh, he was showing us his cool new tires yesterday on his Jeep. Okay? He was led by the Spirit. He's been saving the money because he knew he was getting ready to have to buy new tires. So he had set the money aside, and he was waiting, and he said he got up Saturday morning, and the Spirit spoke to him and said, today's the day to buy tires. And so he said he drove to um, some someplace near, tire some, place. Yeah, some tire place, and um, let's see, what did he do there? Well, he just got prices. Oh, yeah, he got prices there. $100 just for rent. Yeah. Then he said he heard the Spirit say, go to the Chrysler G Dodge and King. And he argued with the Lord. Now, how many of us do that? Okay. Uh, so, and he said, uh, and the Lord said, that, and Pete said, no, Lord, I don't want to go there because you know what they did to me the last time, and they tried to rip me off, and blah, blah, blah. And the Lord said, go there. And so he went ahead and drove over there. And uh, and so he they ended had, up. They had six cents of tires and rims because people lots of times will buy a Jeep and want to put their own tires and rims. And uh, they were really cool looking rims with the big oversized tires, but they can't sell them as new because once you title a car, it's used. So he got five new rims, five new tires, balanced installed for a thousand bucks. Wow, that's good. And they were big, huge, wide tires, you know, they were, yeah. not, they were big. Anyway, but see, that, that's the life of the spirit. That, that, he literally will lead you and guide you. He'll tell you where the, where the fish with the, the coin in the fish's mouth. He'll tell you where the money is. He'll tell you where your next paycheck is. He'll tell you where your food is. He'll tell you how to raise your kids. He'll tell you. I mean, it's amazing what he tells you. And, and I'm going to tell you this. I'm, my, some of you might have already heard this, but I think it's so cool, and I just can't wait to see how this all pans out. This All this stuff with Trump, uh, we were listening, and we don't listen to it very often. I don't know why we were even listen to it, but we are listening to Fox News in the truck. On the truck. And driving to a restaurant. And I literally was struck with fear. And and when Hillary came out, they were talking about Hillary coming out, and I thought, boy, she's been quiet this whole time, and now all of a sudden she's coming out. <laughs> and I was literally, I mean, I was struck with fear, spirit of fear. 
okay? Not just normal fear, a spirit of fear. Just grip me for a couple seconds. And then immediately the spirit said to me, and it was so quiet. You know, sometimes it's loud in your spirit, and sometimes it's so quiet, like, you, you know what I mean? And uh, and then you, and that just comes with practice to, to discern, you know, when it's, if the Lord's talking to you. But anyway, it was very quiet, and I heard greater, uh, I mean, I heard um, all things work together for good to those who love him or call according to his purpose. And immediately following that, I heard this is a Haman moment. And if you know the story of Haman, okay, Haman had planned to kill all the Jews, okay, and God stopped him. And Haman and all his cohorts were hung on the very gallows that, that he was going to hang Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai on. So, and that's what God said. Now, I have not been studying Haman. I have not read Haman recently. Haman was nowhere on my radar. Okay, so, and that's one good way you know when the Lord is speaking to you. Because now, if I had just read it or I had been thinking about it or something like that, but I mean, Haman, I have not read that. You know, and that immediately came into my head. So I believe, and y'all watch what happens with this Trump thing. And uh, so anyway, so my point in, in this parable of the sower is that he did not seek knowledge of his master. He didn't take the time to say, now what would my master want me to do with this money? What does my master think? He operated out of fear. Yeah. I, I, I want to say there's two things you can that are glaringly obvious to me in that. Number one, he gave according to each man's ability. Right. Notice that. He didn't give the guy that gave one talent, he didn't give him five talents because that would have been beyond his ability. God never calls us to do something um, that is completely beyond our ability. Now, that being said, he will stretch you in other words, he's not going to call me to go in there and be and try to be a brain surgeon, a neurosurgeon next week. That, that's not my ability. But the other thing we glean from this is the man didn't even trust God. He didn't trust his master, and he was lazy. He didn't even try to use his talent. How many people have talents that God has given them a talent to work in the body of Christ, and they just won't do it? It's a very sobering thought. Because look what happens to him. So what I want us to see is that he acted on self. He did what self wanted to do, what self thought was best. He never stopped to consider, what does my master want? What does my master think? What will my master do when he gets back? Mm -hmm. And that's what we do with that scripture that we started off with. That we, that we don't know God's thoughts and we don't know his way. But do we try to find out what his ways are and what his thoughts are? I, got, I can chime in on that. <clears throat> so, cause, so you know, people are like, well, I don't want to trust the Lord. And so the first girl I was engaged to, I always had this thought, oh, God's going to send me somebody other way. Or I'm not going to be attracted. How dumb. That's because you didn't. And I didn't even pray. And then when I met her, she was like a monster energy promotion girl. She's totally hot. And got saved like third day after I met her. Got saved on fire with the Lord, just like that's a prime example. Everybody's like, oh, I don't want to trust the Lord. What if he calls me to do this or do that or whatever? If he called you to Africa, you'd have a blast. If that's what he called you to do, you'd have a great time. So I told a friend the other day, I said, if the Lord tells me to go sell all my tree gear tomorrow or even just give it away and sit on the side of 85, I would just be, I'd be sitting there and just wait out there. Well, somebody's going to pull up and be like, hey, that's the guy we want in that movie, whatever. But that's what people are afraid of. They're just like, oh, God, God's going to, oh, he's going to get, don't call me to do something I hate doing or whatever. Well, and also, when he calls you, he equips you. Yeah. Right. That's that's right. That's that, that, and I remember when we, I don't think I ever thought that, but but I, 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 I remember when the boys were little and we didn't always, you know, read at night and and everything. And I remember Jeff and I were sitting in their bedroom floor and we had read and we were praying. And, and I remember like Jeff had this unbelievable fear that God was going to call us to Africa. Okay. I mean, you know, he, he, I mean, it was palatable. I mean, it was a real fear. Yeah. And, uh, and so, and I never thought that. I thought that was ridiculous. But in his mind, he really, you know, and, and that came, that was immaturity and we didn't know the word, you know. But anyway, 
anyway, but I never forget it that night because he, he liked surrender that night in their bedroom. And I can still see him sitting there on the floor. And he said, Lord, even if you call us to Africa, we'll go. And, I, and he had no intentions of calling us to Africa. He called us to Ball Brown. You know, but, that, but you know what happened? That, that was something he had to do. He had to surrender. You know, he, even though the Lord knew that was ridiculous and he wasn't going to do that, he honored Jeff's willingness to say, I would go. You know, but that, that, that God's not going to do that to you. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, that's just immaturity and not knowing the word. But, but anyway, but back to this guy. He acted on his S-E-L-F. And what was the outcome? Not good. It was not, not good. good. It was not good. So, so he should have taken into consideration what his master might think. Because self always, always, always gets you in trouble. And in this case, it got him severe punishment, as did the ten virgins. So in both parables, they missed out on heaven. Yeah. Okay? So this is serious business. Okay? You don't want to miss out on heaven because guess what? This life is a, it's a vapor and it's gone. Okay, I'm telling you, I'm 56 years old, and I cannot believe, I cannot believe I am 56. Do I have an amen? Because who, who, how fast has it gone? Very fast. Very fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my mind, I'm still 20, you know? I, I don't know where it went, yeah. you know? I mean, it's incredible. And so, so I'll leave you this. There's many lessons that can be taken from these stories, these parables. But I think the main lesson that I hope that we get tonight is relying on self is a grave mistake. You will be sorry. And we are all born broken. We're all born the same way. We're all born broken. And we're all born with this emptiness. And I bet if I asked every one of you, if you know what I'm talking about, that emptiness, then every one of you would know. And, um, and because we're born with that emptiness because it's reserved just for Jesus. Yeah, it was just like when I watch that movie, I always go back to that with Tom Brady <clears throat> after he won his fourth Super Bowl. About 60 minutes. Millions of people watching it. Guys going down the list. Well, Tom, you just won your fourth Super Bowl. You know, you're married to one of the most beautiful women in the world. He's like, he's like all the money and all this. And Tom Brady looks at the guy and goes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's all true. He's like, sometimes, you know, I lay in bed at night and I go, is this all there is to my life? I am yelling at the TV, going, so I tell the gospel, he's so prime. Guy has got everything a man can honestly have in this life. And literally looked at that guy and said, yeah, sometimes I lay in my bed at night and I go, is this all there is to my life? Wow. And that guy's got everything, but he has nothing. I, that's the story. I did get this bed. Right. Mm -hmm. Went to, and I decorate homes for Christmas, so I've done a lot of mansions, okay? But I went to this one mansion, like 12,000 square foot house, okay? One man living in it, okay? And he's very sick, and the doctors literally have killed him. They, they made a mistake in surgery. They did the wrong surgery. They did the wrong oh, surgery. Oh, my goodness. This man is pitiful. All right. he, his wife left him. He's sitting in a mansion. His first wife divorced, his first wife divorced him. And his, his, his second wife left him. He's sitting in a mansion. With now, with his dog. Now, you tell me, what good is that mansion? Mm -hmm. I, I, as I said to him, well, at least you have a lot of room to move your walker around. He's on a walker. And, and I mean, that, that, what do you say? You know, and uh, I mean that, it, it, but but yet yeah, he still wants to boast and still wants to show you this and show you. I mean that that's all he has, and and what he has is nothing. I mean he has nothing. He has no hope. He has no future. He knows he's dying, and and he has nothing. And so you know what? I mean we all need money to live, but guess what? I mean, all, and that's why all these celebrities kill themselves because they they have nothing to live for. And they don't have, and they have that hole in their heart that only Jesus can fill. And if you won't let Him fill it, then then you're. That, it may be even to one extent harder for them because they finally reach that level of success, and they're like, "Well, I've got everything. Why is and yet this?" And still, and still, yeah. they are empty. 
Yes. You know, some of the Bible says it's hard for a rich man to go and get a heaven and a camel to go through the eye of a exactly. needle. Yeah. Because it is, I think a lot of people get surrounded by their riches and they mm -hmm. can't see the forest for the trees, if you know what I mean. Yeah. They got all their stuff around them and they think I'm doing good, but they're really empty inside. They're not happy. Yeah, right. and that's why they end up doing yeah. so, so, and so. So, I want to ask you, every one of you, what are you doing with that knock on your door? I answer. Good. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> every one of us hears that knock at some point in your life, and it's up to you to open it. you got to open the door. And I want to know what you're doing with that call on the inside of you. This man that we read about in the parable, he did nothing. And nothing is what he got. Okay? So if you want nothing, then you just keep on going about your business the way you're going. But if you want something, you want a better life here, and you want heaven in eternity, then, then let's, let's set out tonight to make a decision to mind that word and to come whenever the door is open and to learn all we can because that's, that's, that's where your life's going to change. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get better and better and better. Do I have an amen? Amen. Because <laughs> I know. I've lived long enough to know. And, and on that, it's not that the Christian life is without suffering at times and trouble because mm -hmm. Jesus suffered because he was in a world that hated God. Mm -hmm. And if he suffered, we'll suffer for his sake. And I talk about suffering in your body, but I'm, the devil's always going to come against us. But we have somebody that the world doesn't have. I had someone ask me before, well, bad things happen to everybody. Yes, but I got a Savior that loved me, and he'll take me through it. The person that doesn't have Christ, they have all they got is their strength. That's it. And that's not enough. No, that won't carry you very far at all. No. I'm reminded of It's getting easier for me. I'm going to tell you, I've run my life into the ground. I can quit driving. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally, I literally told Lord out loud, I was like, Lord, I am done driving. You take the wheel. I'm done. There is a song, Jesus, take the wheel. Because God will always lead you. He'll always lead you to victory. Yes. Exactly. So. Exactly. I'll end with this, and then we'll, we'll go. Story to Stephen being stoned. Okay, he just like I just said, you know, Stephen was stoned by the Jews for his beliefs in Jesus, you know. But what guess what? He's having these gigantic rocks thrown at him to kill him. And what does he see? He sees the whole heavens opened up mm -hmm. and he sees Jesus sitting at the right no, hand of the He was standing. standing. Oh, standing. 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 Right. I believe okay. he was standing because yeah. he was getting oh, because he was getting him into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was standing. And uh, how cool was that? I mean, I, I, it doesn't say, but I don't believe he felt a thing. I really don't. I don't believe that he yeah, felt a thing. Yeah, described him the only thing he was. Uh -uh. And then he just went to heaven. And then think about who was holding his cloak. Was Paul. Yeah, Paul. Was holding Saul. Pharisees. Yeah, was Saul. Saul. Became Paul. He was yeah. not Paul then. So you know what? If it does come down to suffering or persecution and, and, and pray that that doesn't happen in the U.S., but if it does. Well, Oh, I just saw... Uh, we're all persecuted. It well, may not okay. be unto death in this country, but if you're going to live godly in this world, you will be persecuted. But I saw in Belgium, I saw a clip yesterday of uh, Belgium, and they had some big parade in Belgium. They had big, elaborate floats of uh, heads that looked like Jews. And the whole float was uh, against the Jews. I, I mean, it was like death to the Jews. It was like, it was like Nazi Germany. It's terrible. I mean, they said very few Jews live in Belgium because they've all fled. 
And one one guy that they interviewed, they said uh, they said he said uh, that uh, something to the Christians, and he said, you know, you're next. Yeah, yeah. they're already gone after them in England. It's mm -hmm. always the Jews first, and then the Christians. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, so you know what? Uh, uh, if, if I'm going to die like that, I sure want to die with Jesus. I don't want to die without him because I got I got news for you. It's not going to be fun. Yeah. So anyway, that that's it. And next week we'll.